I am so, so excited to have Vibke Ullendorf on our Day in the Life of an OBM interview today. Vibke is an OBM who trained with us inside of the accreditation a couple years ago and since then has made the full transition from VA to OBM. And in this interview, she shares so many nuggets of wisdom. Guys, she has been a nomad for the last five years and is talking to me from her beautiful house in Chile where she lives with her partner. And I just really think she's incredible and you're definitely going to want to stay tuned for this interview. Welcome, Vivka. We are so, so excited to have you here and to really like get to know you better because you have such an incredibly inspiring, unique story. So I would love to start with just a little bit of your coming to your own story and like really how did you find this like digital life? And I know that you started off from a very, very different beginning. You started off, you know, as a police officer in Hamburg, which is amazing and incredible. And I just I would love to know how did you find this amazing world online and and what did that look like for you it wasn't a fast transition <laughs> <laughs> for sure and it came with this very specific pivotal moment in my life when i decided that i cannot be or live in hamburg anymore or live in this world being a police officer it was just not for me it was mentally exhausting and isolating me and i felt like being in a cage. I was doing fine. Like as a police officer, it's also not the best paid job in the world, but it's paid well enough so you don't have to worry about things. And I had a partner. I had this job that where you're safe, I mean, safe financially, and I wouldn't have to worry for the rest of my life or pension and all that and lived in a nice place. But it was like a cage. I couldn't Golden express pain. my... Yeah. Golden cage. Yeah, I couldn't express myself. They called me in German. They called me ja, aber, Wiebke. Yes, but. So ja, aber means yes, but. I could never just accept things. I always was asking questions. And in this type of job, it's not really wanted. Appropriate. So, <laughs> <laughs> I had this moment where I also wasn't healthy anymore. And then I just decided I have to quit. That's what I did. And it's not normal to do that. When you are a police officer, you work for the government in some form because it's so safe financially and Germans love that. But before I quit, I went abroad first. Like I traveled to Chile, where I live now, <laughs> and just left everything behind. Like I knew already I wanted to leave, but I needed to first get this distance because I thought Maybe I'm just not made for the street, but I could be criminal police and solve cases and that's <laughs> that sort of thing and be safe behind my desk. So I applied for the university there, the police academy to study, and I was accepted. So before starting, I left and I traveled and I met new people and new experiences and I was completely alone there. And then I came back <laughs> one day <laughs> and I started the university one day and I sat there and I knew this was not for me like this whole institution I it was toxic it was not welcoming it was not me I could never be able to live my creative self so yeah that's when I went to my boss I know I never <laughs> I'll never forget this moment when I just sat there and I felt so good telling him ah. I'm done <laughs> I quit that's it. That's amazing. And the guy, he didn't know how to react. And he was like, this, I, I never had to do this before. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I, Where are you <laughs> going? What are you going to do? <laughs> how will you make money? Uh, yeah, they asked me all the things. And I said, I don't know. Yeah. Just not here. I had no plan. And then I went to China. And China, this is where everything started. You were looking for like a regular job? Yes. I knew that was easy to teach English in China. So I was looking for a teaching job, even though I didn't, I don't have particular teaching skills. Um, but I knew that I could do anything after working as a police officer. 
like me, I like guess small, I'm for German woman, I'm small. And I was just 17 when I started. And I was with 18, 19, walking around with a gun telling people what to do. Okay, then I can teach children English. Like now you're still <laughs> telling people what to do, but without the gun. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I still tell people what to do. Yes. And I think from the police, this is where my confidence also comes from. This this attitude of let's do this. Like I, I'm I'm confident we can do anything if we just bring the, the right confidence. Real leadership so, skills. Yes, you've always had those leadership skills. And so that's such an important yes. thing that you've brought to your OBM role. So tell me more about this China though. So you did you start teaching English in China? I did. I also um, did that. Les also <laughs> living and moving overseas. I also did the teaching English thing for a hundred. Yes, time. very classic. <laughs> Virtual yeah. high five. <laughs> it was really fun. And I worked with kids from all ages, from like wow. really small, two years old babies that were, they couldn't even speak Chinese. And then they were already saying English things to uh, 15 years old. So wow. I was working during the week with really small kids. And then on weekends, I worked with teenagers. That was in person. And that was like even more boosting my confidence, my my self-esteem. And it's still like leading and doing something completely different. that had nothing to do with my past, but I managed. They just loved me. I had just started singing and dancing and talking. And, it's, I and it was, soft it was sick. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, a work with, with my soft skills. And at the police, it's also one very important lesson that I learned in police academy. I don't know if I can say that correctly in English, but it's say, it says something very often you will find yourself in situations where you have no idea what's going on and what to do next. And you are panicking inside, but you can never let the other person see that. So you are trained to show up confident despite being completely clueless. Oh, wow. I don't want to do the whole <laughs> fake it to make it kind of thing. But a lot of the times as OBMs, we do have to leverage, you know, maybe you kind of have to keep it together on a call with a with a client because they're telling you about some new software that they've discovered and you have no idea what it is or how to use it. And then you're just like kind of Googling on the side and then you know, taking the time to like, yeah. rather than coming back and still being very <laughs> confident with your clients. So yeah. Yeah, it, it has helped um, also us in OBM exactly yes. in that moment. It was like sometimes then I sit there, mm -hmm, okay. <laughs> and then later I check and learn everything about it and come back. Oh, I know exactly how to do this thing. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, but oftentimes I also just say it and just that that also comes with confidence, being able to just say, I have no how to do this thing, but so I will figure it out. Here you are now in China teaching English. and. When did the little bird on your shoulder whisper the digital nomad, you know, you can do this virtual thing? Like, how did you discover this world? And did you know about the VA role, mm. the OBM role? Did you know about any of that? No, absolutely not. That's how I was teaching English. I realized that I don't want to live in China any longer. So I needed to find something else. So the next step was starting an online business teaching English wow. um, and German and whatnot. So that's what I started when I started my business online. I just transitioned from teaching in person to teaching online. And then, yeah, um, a business. <clears throat> that's also a huge thing. You know, I think that, er mm -hmm. that first entrepreneurial step where you like put your stake in the ground, you're like, I'm starting a business. That's a huge endeavor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was quite easy because I had all the contacts and people who already wanted to learn from me because I make friends with the kids' parents and the kids' parents wanted to study English with me. <laughs> so I was like, okay, come, come here. <laughs> so it wasn't too difficult. I ended up teaching English, business English, even mm -hmm. though my English wasn't that <laughs> So I sometimes had students who were whose English were better than mine. So it felt wrong still. And I knew I needed to find something else that feels more me. So I started digging and researching. And then I learned about virtual assistants. And I thought, oh, that sounds doable. And I did a course by Hannah Dixon. It took me maybe a month after starting the course. And I had my first client. 
And then another month I had the second. All and the then... parents of the kids that you were speaking. That you were teaching. <laughs> no, I quit teaching. It was again, it was, I needed this entire cut. I was just, okay, I'm done. I don't teach anymore. And then it stopped. I didn't teach anymore. Start your, did you start your service support professional business from China? Were you in China when you started this? Wow. Yeah, I was in China. But then we moved to Thailand and we were traveling in the whole Asia, Japan, and my, my husband and I, we were not married back then, but we traveled in Asia and then we eventually came back to Chile. And in 2019 was when I started the VA course. And then I had, within three months, I had three clients and I was working full time as a VA. And it only took one and a half months or so when I found myself in a managing position. So I was... <laughs> <laughs> I was project project managing things and it was my my first client who said to me you are overqualified for this I was doing like admin I started with calendar and inbox management and very simple admin tasks because I didn't believe I could do anything else so I was like no I'm an admin VA and that's all I do and I can do data entry and I felt good doing that but then they told me you're overqualified for this and I was like what are you talking about I've never done this before I wondered why why she would say that and then with another client um, I was working as an operations manager because I was building systems and I was hiring other VAs to work in these systems and I was coordinating all these different areas and then I hired my own VA. It was after three months in the business. I hired my own VA to help me with all these different things. And then I decided I want to um, start an agency because all my clients need content creators. And I have so many contacts. My brother is a video editor and also audio engineer. So I can offer podcast editing and video editing. And social media is so cool. It's so fun. I mean, I can do it myself. And then I have this really amazing friend and she does social media. And so I started hiring all these content creators, suddenly I sat there managing my own content creation agency <laughs> that I called Geeky Tree. Yes. And I was an OBM in my own business while working for the, by then I stopped working with um, one of the three VA clients I had because they transitioned to doing something else, which was good. So I have my own business as a client, so to say. Yeah. And then I, I did that for quite a while. Having two VA clients, I was already working as an OBM, and but I didn't know. Having an agency, and at some point, we were 11 people in the team, yes. 12 with me. I think, that's when, I think that's when we started speaking to one another. Because yes. I remember your agency in its, you know, at the beginning when you first started to kind of look around, like, when was that point for you? Because, I mean, I'm also, an, as an agency owner, I know that there is a point for all of us when you look around and you're like, what have I created? <laughs> I've created a monster with this agency. <laughs> to be honest, I felt at some point a bit burned out because I set it up all wrong. I just jumped in and did all the things, but I made many mistakes when building it. It was performing really well. We made good money, but I had major, not imposter syndrome. I mean, yeah, I guess that's part of it, but imposter syndrome mixed with like a money mindset. So it was right. undercharging clients and I always really felt tired. So you're like exhausted on top of it because you're working so hard. So you can't like yes. function properly. Yeah, it was a nightmare because I set it up wrong, made so many mistakes, undercharging. So I overdelivered, undercharged the typical and I didn't have much margin because I felt always like I'm a people pleaser and I my team is like oh, I have to protect them all so I gave them all the money I didn't pay myself so in the end I was exhausted I made more money when I was just working as a VA like personally my business made great money but me I was doing better when I just had my three VA clients like and I, I wasn't happy being a VA so something is wrong and then the, ne the next pivotal moment my VA showed up one day saying, okay, so I'm going to become an OBM. I'm doing this program. Just so you know, I think I'm going to transition out slowly because I really want to focus on my new career. Oh, what is an OBM? <laughs> so I had no idea. But I said, okay, fine, cool. That's um, I'm happy for you. But it just didn't 
leave my head anymore like bm online business management yeah so i started learning about it and then i found hannah was always sharing when everything that you post like she was reposting in her internal group and always talking about it and then one day i asked her about it like who's Sarah No Kid and what's this all about? Like, what are you sharing here? It's, it looks interesting. So she told me about it. Yeah, and that's when I downloaded the OBM Starter Kit and I that's- learned more and I was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. Yeah, and that's when I jumped on a call with you because I didn't do the OBM week. I think I missed that window. But somehow because I was running an agency, I felt like, I already know how to do this all. And then, and so I was like, let's see if I can learn something new. It was like, oh God. And I had no idea. I didn't know what I didn't know. I was maybe too confident, like thinking, I know stuff. <laughs> so after I left this call, I was like, no, I, I don't know stuff. I, no. the, the way, the way that you were talking to me and sharing about what I'm going to learn in the program and how other OBMs were doing and how bad I was doing financially and emotionally and being completely exhausted, working 16 hours a day. That was when I decided to not be an agency owner anymore. So I talk to everyone on my team and I let go of most of them. I still work with one person for who was back then working with me. She's still in my, on I my team. I had only today. one surviving client in my OBM. <laughs> I mean, my team member, my oh, team member. Team. Yeah, but, awesome. Yes, but also, but also client. I still have that one client from the beginning, like beginning, beginning as who I started my second client ever still working with that person. You had mentioned, you know, people coming up to you and being like, Vibka, like, you know, why aren't you an OBM? Even with an MBA and having sold a landscaping company, I also felt the need to start as like a very basic admin level VA. And I want to point this out because I think so many of us struggle with mindset always and forever as entrepreneurs. Like, you know, just for the record, but I want to speak a little bit to what you would have told your younger self. Like, what would you say to that Vibka of four or five years ago that literally questioned everything about themselves and their capabilities? Like, what what would you tell that younger version of yourself? Because I think our listeners here maybe need to hear some of this. I would tell myself that everything, all the fear and the things that are your feeling, that's all just in your head. Everything that you're telling yourself that your clients might be thinking or expecting or all the drama and panic that is going on, it's all just in your head. Mm. It's not real. If I had this mindset back then, I had a lot of anxiety and panic when I started. And that's why I also over-delivered so, so much to the day it all okay. still happens because I constantly think my client think the worst of me. I have to be perfect all the time. And it was never true ever. Sometimes I ask or I find out later. I make up so many stories in my head and especially in the beginning. And it's all not true. You know, it's so interesting to me because I don't know if you feel this way or you've kind of maybe made this connection as well. But I often find that our strength is naturally our biggest weakness. And it very much is this double-edged sword. So, you know, I'm a recovering people pleaser myself. I have the same feelings and thoughts around, you know, the drama, the unnecessary client drama, the putting ideas into the mind of my client of what they could be thinking. And I'm constantly worrying about what the other person's thinking and how I can make everybody like me. And I used to really struggle with beating myself up about that. But then I realized at some point along the way that that is also the best quality about me. That's the quality that makes me give a shit about the work I do for my clients. That's the quality that makes me, you know, spend a little bit more time with a team member when they are struggling with something instead of just being like, forget it or fuck it, we're done, you know? And I think it's so important Mm -hmm. to remember and recognize that, you know, just because it's a weakness, it's also a strength. And it's just about how you use it and how you leverage it and how you feel about it. So I think it's so important to really just 
be honest sometimes with ourselves and also remember that like how far you've come and remind yourself whether you're, you know, I always say, like, I always tell people, you know, keep a journal of the goals and the wins that you've had and the things you've accomplished. But, you know, I sometimes don't do it for myself. And then I'm like, damn it, you know, I would have loved to have this chronological sort of, you know, thing to look at here and there when I'm like really beating myself up about something that is Mm -hmm. usually out of my control, oftentimes made up you know, of some kind of drama that's existing in my mind that doesn't exist for anybody else. So I really do feel you on that. And I really thank you for being honest because we all feel so insecure. And, you know, despite being a police officer and telling people what to do and and literally being trained to be confident, it's like such a personal growth journey, the whole entrepreneurship thing. And so, you know, looking back, I mean, this is, you're like years into being an OBM now, you've scale the agency down and up. Would you say that you are running an agency now as an online business manager again? Like, are you moving back into that again with a different mindset? I think I have a hybrid now because I really like being an OBM and work directly with clients. But I also like offering the opportunity of bringing on my own team. So most of my clients hire me plus team. And I transitioned my VA clients. Like there was a time when I wanted to be more hands-on again. And then I tried and I realized, okay, no. (laughs) So I transitioned those clients over to my team and I have a few clients that have nothing, like no touch points at all. Like sometimes they talk to me once a month, but my team is fully working with them as VAs. I sent them invoices. (laughs) That's it. So it's like, I have a few clients. That's a beautiful (laughs) thing, Vivka. That is a beautiful (laughs) thing. So for our listeners here and for people watching, what does your business look like? How many clients do you have and how many team members do you have? I currently have in total seven clients, I think, and a few one of projects project-based things or like subscription-based clients, like website maintenance clients or troubleshooting. I have one. I love it. Those are the moments where I can get my techie brain working and figure things out. So I have one client I personally do website troubleshooting for, and it happens maybe once a month, maybe where I have to do some something, sometimes two months, nothing, but then I can just sit there in a few hours, do that. If I can't, I have a person on my team who does that. But I have three team members, actually four, but um, she's leaving by the end of the month. Plus yeah. me. So we have we have five, but one is transitioning out by uh, the end of the month, doing other things. So we're going to be four with me. And that's how it stays. Like one, one of my team members works with different clients like herself, but she's also part of almost... <laughs> every team that I work in. I have one girl who does customer service for one of my clients. So I brought her on. Like I managed to create this not agency type where you just connect client and VA, but where we all work together as a team. So if someone takes a vacation, then we can jump in. And I love seeing that on, on Slack, on the workspace when one of my team members needs support with something. So they talk to each other and like, hey, I need some tips from you. Like, how do you handle the, I don't know, video editing for this and that. And then she jumps in like, okay, send it over to me. I I help you. I fix it. And so they work together and it just happens and it works. And I also, and I think that's the thing with being very people pleasing, but also in a good way. Now, one of my team members, I realized she was really stressed out and exhausted. And I asked her if she needs a vacation, but there was no one who could do what she does with really tech VA and specific work where you would need high level tech skills, which I knew that I have. So I sent her vacation. I did this for one week. Like I did her job for one week and it was fine. I was happy to do that. But then also in the past, she's done that for me a few times. So it works. Like we are all equal. The real team. Yes. I think that's Mm -hmm. also something that you can be very proud of being able to grow and hone over the years. I often think about when I first started off in this space, I was so proud to be a solopreneur for like two or three years. I was like, I can do everything. I don't need anybody Mm -hmm. who needs a team. Like... And I was really, really adamant about being a solopreneur. And then naturally things happen. You get burnt out, life happens, and you realize that 
All roads lead to team, whether you accept it or not, especially when you are working virtually, like especially, you know, in my world today, I am so grateful for my international team that, you know, when the world is the world and things, you know, awful things are happening in the world, my business can continue because of my team. And so Mm -hmm. I love that you mention just treating your team well and being there for one another, because I think it's our soft skills that really do make such a difference in how we conduct business. That's also a really, really good point because also being a solopreneur is lonely. So it's not not fun, maybe for a while, but then it's you're not just going to need people to to help you, but also to not do it alone because it's a lonely path. So lonely. Um, and it's something that I think I realized quite fast because the, when I I was I was three months in business when I hired my first VA because I didn't want to do certain things but it also took me a while to realize that I need more support and not just little admin task and bookkeeping and all the things I didn't want to do but it's more not doing it alone right um, not sitting there and I, I built this business alone so i i needed someone also who i could brainstorm with who can you can bounce ideas around and who helps you create things and it's just so much more fun if you have someone to check in with in the morning like today i'm working on this whether they want to hear it or not but it's yeah. it also because when the ovm it, it, needs an ovm you know? <laughs> yeah exactly and and this is also something that my clients really appreciate this vibe that I bring into teams. We're not a family. We we work together, but still there's this vibe around where we can feel proud saying, hey, we are team XYZ, even though my VA and I, we work in three different teams together. And we, depending on which Slack space we are, we're like team XYZ, team ABC, <laughs> but it's, it's real. It feels real. You have this different spaces where they are all lovely people and we manage to create this vibe there where people show up and they like showing up and and we do crazy things like just like last week I, I oh, was flying to wash yeah. <laughs> I went to to Washington DC to support a client on a keynote it was not just vacation or anything I it was the client saying getting this really amazing offer and the whole team was like oh my god this is amazing if it's really happening it was just like maybe we'll be invited for a keynote in Washington for like a really big conference, important. And I was like, you know what? If you get this, I'm going to fly over there. And then a week later, she's like, did you get your ticket, Bitka? <laughs> exactly. That's what he said. Like, okay, did you, maybe you should look for tickets because I got it. And then the whole team was celebrating. And wow. then I was like, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I will fly over there. And then they were present all the time so for him as the client flying over there I mean that's that's like a non plus like having the the OBM follow you but even if I didn't imagine he was just alone sitting there flying there and have no one to share this with yeah he was checking in in the team I'm in the airport now I just landed in DC and then everybody was like yay <laughs> and then how was it and then he was sharing pictures in our space and we were cheering him on and just this is worth having a team yeah that's very true and that's an important consideration for anybody listening here who is looking to hire a team there are so many benefits to team that so far outweigh the negatives because it's difficult managing people naturally. It's also very difficult to manage a virtual team. Like I imagine all of your team members do not live in Chile. Like I imagine they are all over the place. Yes. And there's so much about creating a company culture with a virtual team that, you know, does come from you have years of experience and you are just very naturally just a very, your level of emotional intelligence is just always very high. I immediately felt that when I first spoke with you. And I think it's such an important characteristic as an OBM to like put people first and, you know, to really have your clients backs and just be there to support them. And I love how you described, you know, that, that, you know, 
almost like needing your own OBM and having someone to bounce ideas off of and someone to have your back and so on and so forth. Because as CEOs, we really need to do whatever we can that keeps us in that zone, that keeps you focused on strategy and building your business and, you know, whatever it is that only you can do in your business. And that's such an important part of what an OBM can bring, which brings me to a really nice transition point where I would love to ask you about your transition from VA to OBM. I know we've already talked a little bit about what it was like to kind of like get rid of some of your clients, get some new clients. What can you share to that person listening who is in the VA role and we've all been there, you and I have been there and just thinking to yourself, you know, do I need to transition to an OBM? Are there things that you can offer? Maybe there's certain characteristics that you felt like you had that made you a little bit more geared. Cause like, I don't say the, you know, I don't think that the OBM is the VA is naturally a transition to the OBM. Like, I don't think that's for everybody. I have incredible VAs on my team who love implementing and who love the doing. And I would never take that away from them because I love, you always need those implementers on the team. So is there something that you feel stood out for you? When I knew that I was not going to be able to focus on one thing and implement and do a great job, it was this constant need of knowing what is going on (laughs) everywhere. I When I work with my VA, who is exceptional, like I love her to the moon and back because she's like such a great human, but also really, really good, a unicorn. I don't think there's a VA like her on this planet because she excels in everything. Like you give her something and she's going to complete it. She's going to do a great job because she sits there and she focuses until it's done and then to a really high quality. And when I did that, while I was doing the thing, I was already thinking of the next and how this is going to impact every other thing and all the moving parts and like what I'm doing, like how can I transform it? I I stopped this one thing because I was thinking of the, of the next thing and, 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 and the next, and I end up doing many things at the same time while thinking of how it's impacting the big picture. And then I started asking questions and I wasn't able to, to focus on this one thing only. So I, I realized I need to have the, the big picture view. And this is how I just naturally transitioned also from a VA and implementing to project management, because with that client, I just said, let me write a project plan for this because I already you know, yeah, I already I know how to do it. <laughs> I need to put this down somewhere. <laughs> and I, yes, and I just did it. And then I wrote the project plans. And then I said, like, I think we should do this and this and this. And it was like, okay, cool, do it. So I started doing the things and I realized I cannot do all the things. Let's hire someone who can help me doing the things. So this is how I naturally transition. And I think when you sit there and you're a VA and you're, you work on on your tasks, maybe you have some repetitive tasks, or maybe you have like your one niche that you do, like setting up funnels, or I don't know, and constantly thinking of how is this going to affect the, the next thing or the other person, and you worry about what everybody else is doing, and, you, and, and it ex- excites you to know what other team members are doing, then I think this is a good indicator that OBM role is better suited Yes. for you then. I appreciate you sharing that because I think it's such an important point to make that for most of us, if we are in the VA role, but we're also in, you know, sort of straddling it with the OBM role for our client, it becomes this very difficult dance of trying to be in the big picture and in the weeds at the same time. And I find that the pressure mm-hmm. that that puts on us as online business managers leads to, you know, emails getting sent out with missing the first name field. And, you know, because you can't quality assure your own work. You need to have mm-hmm. team members and different um, systems so that you can have people that have that big picture strategy vision in mm-hmm. mind. Also, the implementers that are doing the things and then someone kind of like, you know, rounding it all out together and making sure that things Mm -hmm. are rolling out in the way that the client wants them to roll out. So it's so, so such a key factor. So if you are listening and you are thinking to yourself, wow, I am such a big picture thinker. No wonder I've been struggling with my clients in this VA role. Then maybe it's time to start building it up a little bit for yourself in a different kind of way. This was why when it started happening for me, I missed details. 
Yes. And when I was doing my work and I started thinking, is it me? Is something wrong with me? Like, am I not detail oriented? Because I'm sure I was, like, I was always paying a is lot of attention. Like, like, I must be detail oriented. What's happening to me? Yeah. But then it started happening more and more because I'm distracted managing all and thinking of all the things while I was implementing them then if someone else is implementing it and who is detail oriented and who can focus because they really like doing that and really good at it I know if you read The Big Leap but that's something uh, by Gate Hendricks my mm-hmm. zone of genius is having that big picture and think ahead and and back and be in the present at the same time being able to to see all the moving pieces at the same time And that's something a lot of my clients who are actually, by the way, and that's maybe it's coincidence, I attract these type of clients are all ADHD Ah. clients. And and they appreciate that a lot that I can just sit there. They tell me all the things and everything that's going on in their head and they struggle focusing. And I sit there and I'm able to see all of it. But if I also go in working in all of these things, doing it for them, I end up feeling the same way they do, scattered Mm -hmm. and I make mistakes. They are the people who are better suited of doing these things because that's not my zone of genius. My zone of genius is being that person structuring things for the for my clients so they feel calm and know there's someone <laughs> having their back. And I'd love to just sort of talk about how your pricing and how financially things have changed for you. And then I want to sort of end it with like, where can people find you if they're looking for a qualified OBM? And I, I'd love for you to speak more about your client type. Too. You know, you mentioned a little bit about the client that you work with being naturally scatterbrained. Is there a specific niche that you work with as a result of sort of owning, taking more ownership of the OBM role? To be honest, I don't have a specific niche. Most people are small business owners and they're naturally somehow heart centered. They have, they show up with a strong mission. So at the beginning, I said, oh, my type of clients are heart centered people who are like people people's people, People but they all are. So I have to learn much, much more about neurodivergent business owners. So I'm not so ignorant anymore and not understanding certain things. And I just recently realized that this is something I think I could be a big asset because my skills are complementing theirs. And I see that because all my clients have that diagnosed. So that there must be a reason that they find me. They all came to me and they stuck with me. So somehow what I'm doing works for them. And I want to focus on that more in the future going forward. So I think this is this is something like a niche, I guess. But no one is from a very specific industry or like they're all from all sorts of industry, from tech to health. There's really, really anything in it. As an OBM, I'm the same way. You know, I, I always say that like I niche more on the size of a business. You know, for me, it's about how much revenue they make and how much mm-hmm. how many people are on their team. So it's usually to the tune of like around 400,000 a year to about a million in gross annual revenue, and then maybe two or three team members max. That's sort of my sweet spot as well. But I don't really care what the client does. It's more about a personality thing. I, as OBMs, we partner with mm-hmm. our clients. There must be a degree of synergy that happens. With our clients, mm-hmm. it's just like you were saying, heart centered. I would extend that also to being very, very clear on their vision and goals, you know, because they have to be mm-hmm. clear and they have to be very impact driven and dedicated to what they do. And I think that is just such a really beautiful thing. So, if those of you who are listening who are like, hey, I'm a heart centered entrepreneur, hey, I'm all over the place, <laughs> definitely get in touch with Vibka. Now, Vibka, I know that a lot of our listeners here who possibly are thinking about, you know, they themselves making a transition to an OBM, maybe they're thinking about becoming accredited. What words or what advice can you share about your journey, perhaps even how it's like impacted you financially or even things around growing a team? If you're transitioning from being a VA to an OBM and then you went through the program and you were accredited to OBM, don't wait too long to tell clients to raise your rate I waited long and it's really? much harder to suddenly ask you already are an OBM and then you tell hey I'm an OBM and I'm doing this now but in my still in my VA rate it's going to be very very hard to reach an actual OBM rate because after working as an OBM for a certain rate and then suddenly say actually mm, no, my I want to ask <laughs> I know 
you can't you can then you're stuck in that rate and you because it's not fair to the client to say hi i'm gonna raise my rate 20 dollars now it's going to be slow very I slow love, so you I have to you, i love that you say that because there are so many i want to scream it from the rooftops that the the most difficult thing and correct me if i'm wrong but for me, when I was transitioning from VA to, VA to OBM, it was the rates. Like I had such low rates. And so mm -hmm. can you speak to like what that looked like with your clients? How were you able to overcome that? Like I said, I didn't do it right away. I told my clients like, hey, I, I'm doing this program and I'm transitioning to being more uh, in a managing role. And this is how this can look like for your business and how my role can shift, how this can impact you. In this conversation is where I missed mentioning the change of pricing as well, because I was so afraid of maybe not I'm finding fine. OBM clients. So, but I'm not running away. And I, I, I even said that my rate's not going to change. And that was the <laughs> biggest mistake. Yeah, so, you like, we took the gun out. You're like, okay, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot in three. Yeah, two, exactly. One. <laughs> exactly. That's what I did. So that's why I'm saying I made the switch eventually, but slowly oh, like yeah. it took me two years to actually get from it my VA clients who on I work with us in OBM but to to get have an actual OBM rate with them in that role like I have so much more responsibility yeah but I had this was paid the same I just raised it slowly but for every new client um I just gave them my new rate so I had like this <laughs> huge gaps <laughs> and in pricing with different clients and that's nerve-wracking and uncomfortable and also harder to then delegate it's hard to transition it's really hard to transition you mentioned yes. feeling like a scarcity around clients do you still feel like there's a scarcity for obm clients no definitely not <laughs> <laughs> there are so many people needing an obm and us the role of an OBM becomes more popular as in other countries. There are so many wanting that now, even if they're not ready. And that's why it was important we talked about money because I think you have to have a certain income yeah. before you can or you should hire an OBM. Even if you need it, it's probably not, not always advisable to, to go for it. Right. You might have to raise your own rates first because before you can hire an OBM. That's also an experience that I made with some clients and then I did a strategy session with them or that helped them in the end so they might come back later and it actually happened yes they um, come back I know I say yeah. that all the time I'm like you they just need some direction and then they come back and they're like okay I got some SOPs I hired my VA I'm ready to go how has becoming accredited changed your business first of all it made me more confident of calling myself an OBM because even though I was doing OBM work I was calling myself a virtual assistant but once I was accredited I felt like yes this is what I do I'm an, I'm an online business manager and it yes. felt very like it was easier to sell myself credentials putting them on my website and after that it just never stopped their clients coming all the time I have discovery calls Every month, a few, I have at least one strategy session per month. Oh, wow. That's um, great. The thing is also that, like I said, people know about OBMs now and they all know they how, before, what an know. asset it is. In, and that it sounds too good to be true, especially for people with ADHD when you tell them all the things that you can do and then how their life could look like. So naturally, it's something that I want, I want, I want. <laughs> so help people who yeah. really need that structure in there. Yes. Business. Yeah. So I have a lot of people coming to me, but then they make like 3K or 5K a month. And then I already know that it would be such a huge financial investment for them to, to pay me on an ongoing basis. And then they're like trying to play with the numbers or maybe I can hire for 10 hours a month and it's not really making the impact that you need. So I have them on a strategy session and then they get this really nice, and also the, what I learned in the program, this really nice three months plan 
and they see it and it's so structured and they know exactly, okay, these are all the things that I need to do. And I always add little tutorials for certain things. When I add something on the plan where I think not necessarily something that they might know naturally how to do or maybe their VA. So I have a little tutorial that I've made and then I add and link. They can use it by themselves. Like they would need me to to implement it with them. I have a lot of those. Like it will get them to right. the point where they can come back and hire me. And they do. I mean, I, as someone who's been in OBM for many years, I can safely say they do come back. It can take usually yes. a minimum of a year. Because again, you mm-hmm. know, they have to get their systems in place. They have to get their revenue mm-hmm. to where it needs to be, but they do they do come back. Where are most of your clients coming from? Is it mostly word of mouth for you at this point? Everywhere, which is why it's so interesting. I have clients referring me. I have clients who just find me on Facebook. I network in groups. I had leads coming from the OBM directory. So it's from... Our OBM accredited directory. They come Uh from from everywhere, but referrals are probably the main source, I'd say. Good. How has your your own revenue changed? Like, where are you at now? Because I know you have your team and you have Mm -hmm. your OBM clients now. Compared to maybe what you were in your VA business before becoming accredited, like, is there, what does that difference look like for those who are listening, who are thinking to themselves, is it worth it for me to make the transition? Is the money better on the other side? Do I become accredited? Like I said in the beginning, I had a very low money mindset. I had worked really hard on that. Yeah. When I was a VA, my rate was $25 an hour. And now I make $60 an hour, which is still not the perfect OBM rate. I feel like my rate should be at least um, $75 an hour. I have projects that actually make sure that this is the rate I have. So they're project based. And then I have the systems, OBM rate. Yeah, like systems <laughs> the people pleaser to make sure her rates stay where they need to be. That's smart. OBM. Exactly. So they're not hourly, but then this is how much it costs. The the whole project or implementing a certain thing. But this is basically, I think after during the program, I changed my rate, my rates entirely from 25 to 60. That are alone is yeah, it's huge. There are worlds in in between. So it changed um, everything completely. Do you feel like it becomes something more of like a viable business? Yeah, it's also the reason why I was confident that I could settle down and rent a place. Um, Because having a... Wait wait a second. You said you're building something now. Look, I was a digital nomad for five years. So it's... For me, renting something with a one year, at least, minimal contract. Terrifying. That's huge. It's terrifying. I was scared. Like I was shaking when I signed wow. this because it means one year and I have to make sure I make this money one year. And it's really scary. And now we're buying furniture and God, we're talking that. about adopting a cat. And it's <laughs> this before that would have like three years ago, for example, that no way ever but wow. now with this being an OBM and having this lifestyle having the, the the money to support a life that I want having the the money to live it's I'm this is what the put some roots down it's, it's what made it possible because for me as a German who's been who's been trained that you have to have safety insurance like 20 uh-huh. insurance yeah and I think I'm like exactly feeling that same uh, yeah it's, that's like it, yeah, we are. And it's so hard then to take risks. But but once you, yeah. you do it, and I okay. I never had to worry, really. When I have a personal, personal question. I know we've been talking a lot about business. Does your family, how do they feel about you like being a nomad, having a very unconventional kind of job, <laughs> vocation? Are they like supporting you? Are they, because my mother still doesn't know what I do. I feel like, you know, do does your family, are they like keen? Do they understand it? Are they, you know, do they have your back? Do they visit you in all of these like amazing destinations that you live in? I and think I in the beginning. Does. I bet your brother does. Because he's probably <laughs> like, I can work from anywhere too. <laughs> yeah. In the beginning, I don't think they understood really what I was doing. And then they were just waiting like for me to maybe come back or have a real job something typical I think I was lucky with my with my family because my brother 
supported me from from the very beginning my big brother he felt inspired too so I work with him now oh my God. <laughs> I got him on my client's team like he's oh, um, he works for a company that. but part as a side hustle he started you know doing things because apparently it's possible so no why not why not for him too so he does it to get some extra money and he's an engineer so he also allows himself a really good rate so just working a couple of hours on the side for my client's business it's like it's like for like whatever exactly (laughs) nice little rainy day fun i love that and he's my brainstorm body also we take each other accountable like my my big brother is my best friend so and and also in business like my mastermind buddy and my mother works for me um as a VA she does my inbox <laughs> and she but she's not your favorite VA right my I mean she's she's not the the tech one right um <laughs> because so my my mom keep her around <laughs> My mom just recently started a oh, VA course a as well. Like, like she, yeah, yeah. She she felt inspired by that. My mom used to be um, a nurse, but she cannot uh-huh. work in her her job anymore because of health reasons. And then she saw how things work for me. Apparently, whatever the hell I was doing worked. And especially when I asked her, like, hey, can you help me with some things? It was a time when I really needed some support. Then she had time and then she started helping me and she takes care of my bookkeeping as well. She sees the numbers and it's like, hey, it's working. So now she started, um, literally put she started a course. On my body because it's like, it's like the, the cutest thing ever. Like that's such an obnoxious way of putting it, but it really is. It's like food for my soul I love that this has become a family affair for you yeah I I love it I love it too your family and you know that's just such a beautiful thing I mean I can wholeheartedly say because I know you very well that you are exactly how you come across in this interview the loveliest kindest every OBM is different and you know Vibka when I think of you I I feel nothing but like light and warmth and support and I know that oh. anyone who comes across you is just really lucky, really and truly lucky to have you as their OBM. And for those listening here who might have an opportunity to work with you, how can they learn more about you? What is your website? How can we find you on social? You made me cry. <laughs> oh, <you're sweet. laughs> you are the best. I mean, that truly, guys, you really are an incredible human. Oh, thank you so much. Like, I got goosebumps and teary eyes now, but uh, I have a website. Uh, my name is so hard to pronounce for most people, but it's by name, wiebkeuhlendorf.com. And I'm on social, um, on Instagram, oh, we'll Facebook, with the exact the exact same name. Um, yeah, I wish my name was easier to say. Sorry, but... it's, not, it's not hard for me to say, Vipke Ullendorf. It's not hard. It's yeah, once you know, but if you just see it there written for most people, it's just yeah, that's true. Um, well, what is this? <laughs> so, I actually have a video recorded where I explain how to pronounce my name as well. So, maybe we should put that uh, yeah. in the show notes as well. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Video. Yeah, I so appreciate you sharing your beautiful nomadic journey, your transition from VA to OBM, and just European, Canadian. It doesn't matter like what your background is. We all grow up thinking that we can only be and do and like fit into this one conventional box. So, mm-hmm. you know, thank you for just sharing your story and showing others that you know, the the path less traveled really is such a beneficial road to take. And, you know, I think that you are a testament to that. So thank you for sharing your story with us here today. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honor. Like I'm, I'm always fangirling about <laughs> you. So this is very special for me. Thank you, Vipka. Thank you.